Good morning, Geeksprech. My name is Alex, and I with me I got, as always, Eric. Hi, Alex. How are but you doing? Today, it's not just Geeksprech, it's also Geekschau <laughs> at the same time. So we will split it up <laughs> later in an audio file and in a video file. So we've got two things in once. And we are podcasting or recording from? Live at the Microsoft Ignite. Pretty Yay. cool. <laughs> <laughs> and we've got two very, very special guests today. So to my left, Donovan Brown himself, <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Dev, <Dabba>, Mr. <laughs> Blackshirt. Uh, and to your right, Alex, Damien. Welcome, guys. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Yeah, just introduce yourself. So I am Donovan Brown. I'm a principal DevOps manager on the cloud developer advocacy team. And I just built a team, which I'm so proud of. And one of my team members is here, which is Damien. Yeah, so I'm on Donovan's team. Uh, cloud <laughs> developer advocate as well, focusing on DevOps. Um, yeah, part of this awesome League, League of Extraordinary Ooh, Cloud DevOps, DevOps Advocates. advocates yeah. Exactly. <laughs> 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 it was a tough one, though. <laughs> 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 it's a pretty yeah. long hashtag. Yeah. Yeah. We're making it work. Yeah. Yeah. It's working good. Yeah. <laughs> I think so. How, so did, how did Ignite go for, for you so far? Uh, it, it, for me, it was it was intense, right? I was yeah. in Scott's keynote, right? Yeah. And oh, yes. And people don't understand that. Yeah, I was only on stage for six minutes, but that was about four weeks of my life, right? <laughs> preparing, <laughs> preparing for six minutes. The number of rehearsals you do, the videos you have to pr produce before you get there, working with your ghost, because a lot of people don't realize that for everything that I'm doing on stage, there's a guy backstage oh duplicating really? everything on another machine wow. just in case something bad something happens. Yeah, it's ah, just, okay. it's so much coordination. We did two, re two dress rehearsals on Sunday before we even got on stage on Monday, okay. right? So after Monday, I was already exhausted. And then I had my session with Damien that afternoon. Yeah. Luckily, he, he did most of the work in that <laughs> one. Right? So, so I got really lucky. But our session was rated really well. I think we did really well. So I I'm think everything went very well. Thank so you. Thank you so much. was good. Your session was very good. Thank you. I oh. appreciate so that. Thanks. Congratulations on this. Oh, thank you. Excellent. So actually, this week, we heard lots of news about Azure. So starting from new VM sizes, nested virtualization is going on, <laughs> larger disk sizes, Azure Stack is going to GA, and, and all of this. So. What's one special thing for you this week that has been announced? Uh, look, I, I think the Azure Stack being GA is, is awesome. Like, I, I keep hearing questions about this. There's companies who, for whatever reason, for their own internal policies or whatever it is, that they, they feel like they can't go to Azure. Uh, data sovereignty and all that kind of stuff as well. So Azure Stack actually being GA and it, it's becoming a real thing means that they can, they can use that power of Azure and still have you know, that on-premises environment. They're, they're not relying on, on pushing to somebody else's cloud. It's like their own version of Azure, which is, which is quite cool, I think. And what I really like about it is the fact that from a developer's perspective, it's just another region of Azure. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I don't have to create a different pipeline. I don't have to think about it differently. No, it's just Azure, but the region happens to be local in my data center. And when it's time for us to grow up to proper Azure, I just change my region and all my code just works in the cloud as well as it works on-prem. And that, that to me was the biggest selling point for that. It wasn't yeah. as if it's your own private cloud. No, it's Azure in your own data center. And what you do as a developer does not change once you go to Azure proper. And I think it's a pretty important thing. So we both are from Germany, you know. Uh, and actually in Germany, we have pretty bad bandwidth. So <laughs> actually yeah. there are areas we are happy that there is some kind of one megabit, two megabit connections. Um, and so Azure is always a pain point for guys gotcha. uh, out there. And gotcha. now if we can have this same stuff in our own data center, probably with bad bandwidth outside, I think that's pretty cool. No, for sure. For yeah, sure. And everybody was like a little bit excited when Azure Pack uh, was, was announced and they were like, hey, we need something like that. And then Azure Stack came and they were like, yeah, totally mm. freaking yeah, out. Like Azure Stack's so an even cool. easier, right? It's yeah. like turnkey, right? Here, just drop this box in your ready yeah. to rock and roll. It's awesome. Yeah, and uh, we are just right before the, the expo and uh, there are some, some vendors out there who demonstrate their whole environment, their whole setup with, with Azure Stack. Oh, right? very cool. Yeah, mm. that's so cool. That's pretty cool. Something uh, always rising up, and I've seen this during Ignite uh, pretty much, is the security topic. So security is very important because it's quite easy to set up things in Azure, and mm -hmm. it's going fast. <coughs> I think you will talk about this later. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Um, but security at the same time could be an issue. Uh, what do you think about the security stuff with Azure? Um, I think the security stuff in Azure is, is it's paramount, but it's not always it's not just the security of Azure. It's security of the app that you're putting in Azure. Okay. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people are, are forgetting that part of it, right? So we can lock down Azure till the till the cows come home, but if you have a vulnerability in your app, then there's nothing we're gonna be able to do for I mean, 
I hate to talk about Equifax again, but that's literally the perfect example that we have right now. That's they so had true. a known vulnerability yeah. in their application. It doesn't matter where they hosted that thing, on-prem or in the cloud, ours or somebody else's, that was vulnerable. And there's tools that we have built into our tool set through our extension plugin, like White Source, will come in and scan. If they had used White Source with VSTS, they simply would not have had that problem. Yeah. Because we would have alerted them that you have a vulnerability and you need to upgrade that package to this version to protect yourself from it. But, but without having that in place, and what hurts so much for me is that it's so simple to have in place. <laughs> right? it, it's not as if it's very yeah. difficult to do. You drop one task, you don't even have to configure the task. You just drop it into your pipeline, sit back, and it scans everything that you depend upon and lets you know exactly the course of action to take to correct it. So when it's that easy, it's just like, man, how, how, do you, how is everyone not doing this? Mm. Yeah, so it, it, could, it could be so easy, but I think it's the thing like always, so you should have to do it. Yeah. So there are the tools, there are the mechanisms, yeah. but if you don't try it out, yeah, you but talking about tools, I mean, I'm so glad that Microsoft announced finally the Azure ATP solution, which is the, the advanced or the, the next generation of uh, uh, advanced threat analytics, which was a totally on-premise solution. And I'm so glad that they extended it finally to the cloud. I think that's so, so important because with Azure ATP, the, 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 the identity itself stands in the middle of the whole, whole solution. And I think everything is going around the, the identity in the future. So yeah. it's so yeah. good that we have a, a solution around that. Yeah, security, identity, compliance. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's regulation. There's so much that goes into to making sure that your application is, is ready to rock and roll. Right? Sure. I mean, we used to remember as long as it was functionally complete, we were ready to go. Those days are gone. Mm -hmm. right? with, yeah. with so many threats out there, your app has to be bulletproof. And luckily yeah. we have the tools and the pipelines that can validate that for you. Yeah. Or, uh, with every change, you know if you're in the right direction or not. Yeah. Uh, I think another problem is it's just awareness. Oh yes. Right? Oh we, yes. Have, we really have a <laughs> lack of awareness of what we have available and I'm doing the best I can presenting everywhere I can yeah. to make people yeah. aware <laughs> that we have this type of functionality. But, <coughs> and it, it, but also the, the onus is on the developer, yeah. right? You, 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 you got to go out there and do the research necessary to make sure you're doing the right thing for your company. Mm. Yes, you have, you've been to Munich uh, I have. earlier this year yep. uh, for the Azure Saturday, and I think you opened up many minds for yeah. new stuff, and totally. I right. think this was pretty good. As yesterday, I've got my own very own session here at Ignite. It was Azure Do's and Don'ts. Oh, cool. And we've been discussing a lot about basics, like what is a subscription? When should I open up a new resource group? Mm. Uh, how is role-based access control to put in action? Right. And, and all of this stuff, and like you said, it's about awareness. So many were in there not knowing that you can have more than one subscription, oh, or that you can, uh, can yeah. handle down resource access in Azure. Wow. Um, yeah, it's all about awareness. I mean, You're it, absolutely right. it can be hard with Azure as well. Like the, yeah. the product is moving so quickly. Yes. Every day <laughs> there seems to be a new feature that's available, or a new app service, or you know, suddenly we're supporting brand new language out of the box in you know Azure App Service or something like that. It, it's hard to keep track, but you, the responsibility is on you know the IT pro and cool, the yeah, and the sure. developer to to keep track of what they need to know. You know, that's why, that's why you earn so much money, right? Yeah. yeah. Yes. <laughs> and I, I think it's also difficult to, for us that have been doing it for a long time to remember what it was when we didn't know. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's right? true. So for us, resource groups are just, of course, right? And they are there. For, yeah, so exactly. Yeah. But for someone who's new to Azure, who has no idea what a resource group is for, what you put in it, how you protect it, and I think sometimes we speak at a level that we assume you are where we are. And yeah. I love the fact that you did a session that says, you know what, I'm going to drop back down to this is your first day on Azure. These are the things you need to know. And I think we probably need to, and I think also we feel that we've done that one, so we don't need to do it anymore. Everyone's caught up to us, and that's not fair. We need to make sure that people are going to be new to Azure every day. Yeah. And those sessions like yours, I think, are really important to be at almost every Ignite to make sure that they have I that one-on-one. -on -one. I think that's pretty important. So actually today I heard that 75 75% of the attendees, our first time attendees of Microsoft Ignite this wow. year. Wow. So they have never been to an Ignite before. So I think there's pretty new stuff announced. So for our, for us IT pros, it's wow, so many new things. But probably wow. there are guys maybe never had heard before of Azure and all of this yeah. because they were in the client workspace or something like yeah, this. Yeah, exactly. I mean, even I Intune got into Azure these days, right? So we have a solution which was completely out of Azure, which was completely out of that data center aspect coming into that whole Azure environment. And I mean, if you, like for example, if you are a client guy, you, you work with Azure Information Protection, you have no idea of how that uh, infrastructure or platform service stuff 
in, in, in general works, right? Yeah. So mm. it's so diverse these days. Yeah, and, and as, yeah. as Damien pointed out, it, it's like every day a new service. Yes. Right? I mean, I, I honestly, I haven't even caught up to functions yet, right? <laughs> I know what they are. I, I played with a couple, but to really like absorb myself in them because there's so much stuff that I'm, I'm playing more with, with Kubernetes right now and, and Docker. And it's like, man, every time I think I'm about to catch up, we drop like five more new services on me. I'm like, oh my goodness, how am I supposed to keep up with this stuff? So, yeah. but yeah. it's incredible. It's exciting that we have that much at our disposal to exploit as well. So maybe a question that you guys get a lot. How would you start with Azure if you have no idea what Azure is? is? Would you start with DevOps or something like that? Well, I don't know. I think part of it is learning what Azure actually has mm -hmm. in it, right? Because you don't know what you don't know. Um, the documentation, I know that we've been doing a ton of work lately on docs.microsoft.com. Mm -hmm. And that's become kind of a starting point for anything that I don't know about Azure. So if, if somebody comes to me and says, look, I need to know more about how to do DevOps in for this particular type of service that's supported by Azure, the starting point for learning that stuff docs.microsoft.com and there's a there's an awesome new start page for that which just has technologies like spread across the thing you can you drill into them it gives you the the overviews there's some short videos there's walkthroughs there's tons of that information so docs is kind of the number one go-to place to learn about this stuff i think True. um yeah. and then i guess once you've once you've learned what what features are there and what stuff you can start making use of um, Channel 9 is another really good resource. Um, events like Ignite, obviously, are, are fantastic for that kind of stuff. But um, look, I think for, for software development as well, you need to start getting into DevOps as early as possible. Like oh yeah. <laughs> the, the history of kind of uh, treating, your, treating the work that you do as a project rather than as a product mm -hmm. um, means that, so a project, right, has a start date and an end date. Mm -hmm. So you start writing your code, you produce this thing, and then right towards the end, you think about how am I going to put this in production? And that's a bad way of thinking about <laughs> it. It's, it's deferring all of that pain right until the end, right? Yeah. Whereas if you think about it more like a product, it's this thing that step number one is get a pipeline running to production and then mm -hmm. build on that product, continually improve it, and things like that. So deferring the pain until the end of a project is never a good idea. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think it's uh, a big shift in mindset right now because so actually, I'm an infrastructure guy. Okay. So I've cool. always been, I grew up with Hyper-V, Xen servers, and mm -hmm. all those good infrastructure stuff. And if four years ago, somebody would mention, Eric, you will have a Visual Studio on your PC. <laughs> yeah. I was like, yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> same here, You're same crazy. here. Uh, yep. Yeah, but right now, I have it. And right now, I'm talking to my customers. I'm still in the infrastructure area, but I'm talking with my customers about GitHub for a repository to have their scripts in there to create resources in Azure mm. um, and to have versions of uh, script files and all of this. Um, and I think that's changing quite much. So actually, this is all what DevOps is about. So probably we have used this word quite often now. So right. what's a good description for it to, um, to let everybody know? Well, if you were to go to visualstudio.com like DevOps, the definition that we have there is that DevOps is the union of people, process, and products to enable continuous delivery of value to our end users. And the key word there is value. Okay. Right? It, it's, it's not about delivering features, it's not about delivering software, it's not about automating your pipeline, it's about delivering value. And that's something that a dev can do and an ops person can do. I always use the example of Cyber Monday. If Cyber Monday is coming and your e-commerce site can't sustain enough simultaneous users, you don't have to change your application to add value. An IT pro can go in and scale up or scale out my infrastructure, and that's value immediately added yeah. to our product without changing a single line of the application. So it's the value that you need to focus on. And another thing that's key about the word value is that you have to measure it to know if you've done it. You can't just say I've delivered value, pat yourself on the back because you pushed out a new version of code, and then go celebrate. <laughs> if you can't show me faster, um, uh, quicker response times, if you can't show me more simultaneous users, if you can't show me a higher conversion rate of people who visited our site to people who bought something on our site, then you can't tell me that you delivered value unless you measure it, right? Yeah. So that takes you into telemetry. And it's so amazing how that one word value starts to spread out into so many different areas of what DevOps is actually available for. Now the people, that's the hardest part. Oh right? yeah, <laughs> yeah. There's thirty thousand people here between Ignite and Envision, but the majority of the employees at those companies aren't here. 
yes. they're going to go back all excited about what we saw at Ignite and what we want to do, and they're going to hit roadblock after roadblock of people who weren't here and want to keep doing it the way they've been doing it for 30 years and not realize that their competition is already doing it this new way. Yeah. And if you don't get on board now, you're going to be so far behind by the time you realize that we should have been doing this that you're never going to catch up to your competition. So the debate on if we should or should not do DevOps, that's over. You either implement DevOps or you lose. I mean, it literally okay. is that simple, right? Mm -hmm. And it's supposed to bring down and break down those barriers between Dev and Ops so that we can function. So bring the people together. And we need the products, and that's what like, everyone's producing those. Microsoft is producing them. Our competitors are producing them. The products, there's the easy part. The process, I think, is even easier. We know what to do, right? Okay. But getting your people to do it is tougher. Like, we're going to talk about things like configuration as code and, and infrastructure as code, infrastructure continuous integration. Code, yeah, yeah, exactly. It's pretty hard for everybody to <laughs> exactly. understand. Exactly. Right? So we know what to do, but why aren't you doing it? Because yeah. that's not what we've been doing for 30 years. So yeah, yeah. yeah because it was just like clicking through an exactly, SSL. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And a lot of people feel that by, by me clicking through it, I'm the only one who knows how to click out of this stuff, so I'm now more valuable than anyone else. Yeah. They can't fire yeah. me because I'm the only it one who knows. It my job what, right now. Exactly, because I'm the only one who knows which buttons to click. Yeah, right? that's and what that development was for years. Exactly, I mean, and, and if you go on I vacation, now what do you do? Yeah. Right? Right. We can't scale up or scale <laughs> exactly. out of infrastructure because the guy goes on vacation. That's not the right way to think about it. And one other thing that I thought was interesting by what you just mo mentioned is that as an IT pro, it's no longer the developers and the IT pros. Even the IT pros are developers now. Right? Yeah, and yeah, it's, a, it's a been a huge shift because, like you said, you're versioning things in version control, which historically IT pros didn't do. The items that you're versioning are now being integrated with continuous integration, which historically was not done. And then as we deploy our code, your infrastructure's code and configuration's code is all being applied alongside all the applications that's being de developed. So it's interesting that as we go through this revolution, everyone becomes a developer, right? There is no yeah. more that dev versus ops. It's like, you sling code just like we do, it's just your code talks to the infrastructure and our code talks somewhere else. And this is something we have to put into the companies because they are working very structured right now. They still structure in exchange silos. teams, SQL yeah. teams, yeah. silos, yes. Yeah. Um, and way, way, way far away from putting DevOps and infrastructure together. It's the people, together. that's so a people problem yeah. though. People you just education. described it, there's a people problem. Even in yeah. the projects, I mean, there's one, one step where, where you get the code or where you get the solution from and there's the other team that does the migration or there's the, the other team that does the architecture or something like that. They don't work together. It's like more in silos and mm. everybody's doing his part and then just handing over to the next to the next uh, department or whatever. And, and this is, yeah, this is the, the key there that it's a people problem, right? It's, it's about ownership of that product. If I'm a developer and I've written my code and then that code doesn't work in production because it relies <coughs> on something in the environment that's not in that production environment, like you can't just say, well, my bit's done. Uh, I, don't, I don't own production. Like, yeah. it works on my machine, right. that, that good old one. Right. You know, I need to, I need to know what, you know, how it runs in production. I need to know those dependencies. I need to work with the ops team to make sure that the requirements that my software has are there. And the ops mm. team needs to work with us with the developers to know what's actually going to be running on those on that infrastructure, on those services and on those machines. It, it's to do with, you know, it, it's, it's all part of this ownership. You need to own what's actually running in production. And one th important thing is it's making it life easier because right now we have so much interaction between teams because we have to let them know what they are doing and mm. now we have maybe one consolidated platform for it. Um, and Donovan, you mentioned something very interesting. So it's not about products right now. Um, so, and I've had a look into Visual Studio Team Services, and you're implementing things like GitHub and, and other code repositories, and it's not a, all, all about the Microsoft stuff, so you're opening up for other uh, programming languages and all of this. Yeah. Uh, so how important is this? What do you oh think? Oh my God, it, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's fundamentally <laughs> important to us because there's not an organization that I've visited that is 100% one language or another, or 100% one platform or another. And there's always this clear divide of, okay, these are our .NET developers, so they use TFS. These are our non-.NET developers, and they use all something else, right? And I'm okay. thinking, well, why is that the case? Because VSTS and TFS don't care what language you program in. True. Our build system works on Linux, Mac, and PC, so it'll build it anywhere you, you want. It'll leverage any compiler that you want. So why do we have this divide between the .NET uh, guys and everyone else in the organization. You could save a lot of effort by consolidating that into one tool chain. And as you mentioned, we integrate with lots of other things, but I want to be very clear, you don't have to. Because 
the Visual Studio Team Services offering is the only offering that actually has everything that you need from version control, work item tracking, test case management, package management, CI and CD, all from one vendor, all already talking to each other. However, what we realized at Microsoft was is that we're going to be going into organizations who already have an investment in Jenkins, for example, which is the CI system that I face 95% of the time in the field. Okay. And we don't want you to have to throw away that investment because it's working for you. But what you're missing is this release management part, right? You got your CI working. We don't want to throw that away and rip and replace. Can you come in and help us, Microsoft? Yes, we actually can. We can take the artifacts that you produce from your Jenkins build and then run them through release management using VSTS and deploy it to any platform you want. You're not tied to deploying to Azure. If you might have, I think it was two or three weeks ago, mm -hmm. AWS announced their extension for VSTS, yeah. which yeah. means every yeah. asset inside of AWS is now accessible to you from inside VSTS, no matter what CI system that you use. So it's imperative for us at Microsoft to make sure that, when I said this in the keynote, no matter what language you program in, here at Microsoft, we add value for any language targeting any platform. I can't seem to yell that loud enough because I'm like, yeah. no one seems to Do believe me. Exactly. I'm like, guys, you're, eventually you're going to have to believe me because we've proved it time and time again. And what, it was, and what hurts me the most is when I go into a company who already owns all of the stuff that we give them, right? They already have MSDN licenses for everyone, and, but they go and they pay more money to someone for else tools. for the exact same tools again. Yeah. I'm like, I just don't understand why you guys are doing that. And, and that's just, I love development. I've been a developer for 20 years. So when I go in and I see other developers struggling when they don't have to, it, like, it hurts me internally, right? It's like, <laughs> come on, guys. The, the solution is right in front of you. It's so freaking easy to use. And we, there's no language you can give us that we can't help you with. So just mm. let us help you. OK. So what do you think about the infrastructure versus DevOps? Uh, not, not DevOps, versus Dev? Uh, because it's still there. So uh, somebody who's developing an application is still thinking about, oh, I need SQL Server, I need whatever. And on the other hand side, there's the infrastructure guy securing his data center, firewalling, um, and all of this. So is it a mind shift for both? Should they both work together? Or should everybody knows everything? Or yeah, what's, it's what's a good idea for this? It's, it's working together. I mean, as a dev, I, like historically, I'm, you hear about, oh, no, we can't open that port in the firewall. And I'm yeah. like, well, why not? Like, on my dev machine, everything's open. Firewall's <laughs> 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 off. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, just, I, I removed all this stuff that's stopping from working. Can I need to do that in production? No, so I need to understand that stuff. And yeah. I, I mean, I'm not going to go and read a book. I'm not going to go and go to university, study a course, do any of that stuff. There are, there are people in my organization who know this stuff. Yeah, okay. So I need to work with them to, to find out what the requirements are, like find out why the firewall can't just be turned off. Right, because I don't really know that as a developer. I, yeah. I need to work together with the people who have those skill sets in my team. So, the the biggest problem that I see with companies like implementing DevOps just at, at any level is when they decide, right, we're we're doing DevOps now, so let's create a DevOps department, and the DevOps department might talk to the devs and they might talk to the ops department, but it's a yeah. new silo in between yeah. <laughs> the other two silos. Yeah. It's still not people working together, Correct. and that's that's the key part. You know. You <coughs> need you need to use these skills that you already have with the people you already have and work together to find a solution. Everybody's on the same team, right? Yeah. You're trying to get working software and working um, like value out to, out to your users, which is the, the end goal here. Okay. I think yeah. the, key, the, uh, the part that you said is that we're on the same team. Yeah. And I think that is so crucial to understand is that when your application fails in production or when a customer can't complete an order, the entire team failed. Mm. They, right? It's not the devs' fault. It's not the ops team's fault. It's our fault as a unit. And I've noticed that when I finally get my teams to actually perform like a team and don't finger point, that a lot of this stuff starts to come together a lot quicker. Because you know, even when you're in a sprint review and something fails, none of those stakeholders know which developer caused that bug. That's the true. entire team looks bad. That's true. Right? And if you guys start to work that way, I've noticed that they'll score and see who's struggling and they'll go and make them better because we all look better at as a result. And I think dev and ops need to come to that way when they look at the final product as well. Yeah. Talking about uh, bugs and uh, all that all that release management, uh, something that Microsoft has changed, and, and I mean, we have a lot of uh, listeners, a lot of fo followers that come from the, the whole infrastructure perspective. Mm -hmm. So what I'm wondering is, has it become easier for you guys, uh, w the, the, the reason or the thing that Microsoft has released or has aligned the release cycle for products like, for example, Windows 
uh, Windows Server, uh, Windows 10, uh, uh, like for example Office 365, in the meaning of that they release a new version every six months. Is that, is that a strong one? Is that a tough one for you guys? Or is that, is that easier in, in general, I mean, for developers to just get uh, shorter release cycles and do more, okay. uh, like, for example? Well, so uh, what, I can, what I can speak to is what the Visual Studio Team Services team does. Yeah, sure. So, yeah, so whenever you hear Donovan Brown say we, I'm mm -hmm. usually talking about the VSTS Absolutely. team, right? And because, just yeah, the Windows team, the general. Office team, yeah. the Xbox team, the Bing Absolutely. team, list and list. The, we're all on the same DevOps transformation together, mm -hmm. but we're all at different stages yeah. of maturity across Yeah, that. I'm just wondering. Right about this, like you said, DevOps, DevOps transformation. Sure. So on the VSTS team, I don't, guys. none of us wish for the old days, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> none of us were like, man, I remember those days we used to ship every days three was years. Cool. Yeah, <laughs> man, I didn't we're so relaxed. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. No, mm -hmm. no one wishes for those <laughs> okay. days anymore because getting that feedback from our users so quickly to let us know if we are or are not doing the right thing really empowers them. Because when you see someone using your software, nothing motivates you more than that. Right. Right. And you get to see that every three weeks. You get to see it on Twitter. You get to see people's responses on user voice. You get to see them on Stack Overflow. And you get to see this, this excitement over what you've produced. And you get to see that constantly. And I know that motivates me a lot, right? Okay. I mean, every time someone tweets about VS Team or Yo Team, it just motivates me to go back in and add more value. Mm -hmm. That only happened once every three years. I'd get bored mm -hmm. and I probably wouldn't yeah, even sure. look at it and yeah. stuff like that. <laughs> so the faster that we move, mm -hmm the quicker we get that feedback and the faster we can respond to our customers' feedback. So what we're doing now, we ship every three weeks, but we're trying to figure out how we can ship even faster than that because we want to get that okay. feedback. We want to make sure that we're making our customers happy. And if we don't, our competitors will, and then our customers become their customers, right? And, that, and that we definitely don't want that, right? So it's, it's, it's an amazing way to make your customers happy. And I've noticed that our developers are much happier as well because there's nothing more satisfying than seeing someone enjoying your product. That's cool. Hopefully, hopefully that answers yeah, your question. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, what, what I actually see most often uh, is doing lift and shift migrations. Mm. Uh, <laughs> and back to the Azure do's and don'ts. Mm. <laughs> I think yeah, this yeah. is one of the most done things, but probably it's a don't to do a one-on-one -on -one transition of this. Uh, so actually, I try to bring in there that they should think different about infrastructure right mm. now because it's not any longer this, oh, we have this hardware uh, down there, so let's use it. It doesn't matter how large it is. Um, and it's way other to, to create things and to name things because sure. in Azure we have to name much more things when yep. creating a virtual machine, for example. Um, so what do you think, what is the right way to start this transition far away from lift and shift and do all these things now in Azure to a much more modern way using probably past services like SQL Server as a service? Yeah, that, that, <laughs> that's a tough one. The reason why is because to take an application that has historically run in IIS on a machine that you controlled is drastically different than running it in a past service in Azure. Absolutely. Right? I've actually gone through that transition myself. I had an application that was running in a VM in IIS, I knew what time zone I was in. <laughs> I did okay, silly okay. stuff like datetime.now, which you're never supposed to do, but I knew <laughs> okay, what time okay. zone I was in, right? <laughs> but as soon as you go into the cloud, I could be in any region and you have to use UTC time and all of a sudden the way that you architect your application has to change. Okay. It could be anywhere at any moment. The way that you deal with caching is different, right? You can't just use a session state, but you, now you got to use Redis cache. So I understand that lift and shift is a necessity. If I really want to get out of my on-prem data center and into the cloud and it's already running on a VM, the easiest thing for me to do is to lift and shift. Absolutely. But to your point, when you lift and shift, there's a lot more that you have to deal with the network, you have to deal with the firewalls, you have to name all these different resources. You Scalability. Have to them in, yeah, you have to you've got auto scaling. So things do automatically change, but I always tell my customers, I want you to use IaaS as a stepping stone to PaaS. Yes. I truly believe that PaaS is the holy grail of the internet, right? It is. Don't think about what's underneath. Don't worry about the operating system. To you, it's just a virtual directory. Just do what you want there. You never have to shut off the machine. You never have to install updates. You never have to worry about any of that stuff. It's yeah. so amazing. So when I made that transition, I learned a lot about the difference of you're on a box and then you're in a past service. But the benefits far outweighed the investment, right? I've never had to shut down my <laughs> server. I've never had to install another Windows update. Yeah, this is yeah. like. This is what I've been waiting for. My service literally has not had a hiccup in four years since I transitioned over. Oh but right. I know that the server has all the latest updates on it. I just never had to install any of them, right? So it's just, it's beautiful. So I tell our customers, what you need to do is find out what hurts most. Is it the fact that you're on-prem 
or is it the fact that you just don't want to be using those resources anymore, they're old and they're outdated, it's easier to scale up into the cloud, then lift and shift. If you actually have the time to re-architect your application, which it would take, yeah, let's okay. be very clear, to, to leave the physical machine and move into a PaaS environment, then pay that cost if you can afford it because again, the auto scaling, the reliability, it's just, it's such an amazing world, an amazing way to write software. So yeah. I, I use them both, but it, it's on a case by case basis. I can't say one thing is, is perfect for everyone. Okay. Mm. I mean, infrastructure as a service uh, is, is the good kind of stepping point, I it guess. It pays our bills right now. Well, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> it's a great stepping stone, that's yeah. what I say. But so one of the ways you can get to that as well is um, the idea of like infrastructure as code. For so sure. That allows you to kind of change the environment that you're running in or the infrastructure in you're running in a little bit more easily. You're not dependent on your like pet server, I guess, if you can start moving in that direction? It, true, yeah. but it, like for example, if I'm doing infrastructure as code, then mm. the resources in which I stand up can still either be IaaS oh, yeah. or they can be PaaS, yeah. right? So, right. Yes. Yeah, yeah, you, you're right. yeah, yeah, you're right. right. So, I mean, infrastructure as code does not in, in itself dictate what resources I'm going to then stand up. It basically says, I'm going to codify yes. the target environment, whatever it might be, VMs or PaaS, such that I never have to go into Azure portal explicitly and click around to create anything. Mm. At a moment's notice, I can run this script or this basic ARM template, ARM template against yeah. my Azure subscription and then poof, there is the environment that I need or it's been verified. Correct, yeah. yeah. So, but by having that infrastructure as code or having that kind of ARM template as something that's there, you, you're separating yourself a little bit from that hardware that's been Agreed. sitting in your data center for a while. With a specific even, name. Yes, and with the oh specific yeah, exactly. Name. No, or sure. even worse, somebody's like desktop that <laughs> sits underneath <laughs> Jeff's desk. In, you know, yeah, because it's going to speed things like, data re like disaster recovery, right? Without yeah, an ARM template, yep. recovering from a disaster is very, very painful and scary oh process. Yeah. But if you have an ARM template that defines the infrastructure, it's literally just run your deployment again, pointing yeah. at a different region, and your site's going to be back up and running again. Yeah. So and absolutely. And yeah. things I always see is, uh, they are still clicking through the portal because this is what they are used to do. Yeah. Um, mm. <coughs> and, and what we see quite often is we have a subscription for dev tests, building up things, and then there's the production subscription. And right now they are writing down every click so that they can do it later <laughs> in the production environment again Jeez. without losing any step in there. Uh, if we build up it in uh, infrastructure as code right now, I just put this script or this ARM template, put it into the production, yeah. um, and every, if everything is different now, I can do it again and again and again, and that's well, pretty cool. Even in Azure, when you like, when you go through and you click through those things, you can export it things, after. You export that yeah. as an ARM template, <laughs> yeah, like so it's, it's right there. So you that should be the next <laughs> note, export, so I never do this again. That should be the last step <laughs> of every one of those click through things, right? Pro probably we should do an auto download. So if you click finish, <laughs> yes. that You're should be automatically right. downloaded the file yeah, to right. yeah. so Now do this. Yeah. So as we are running a little bit out of time, so just uh, let us know what, what's new in the DevOps world from, from Microsoft Ignite. Have or what, what will be anything? there in the yeah, future. Or what will be there? Well, what will be there in the future, we're, we're going to announce <laughs> That's at Connect. That's a very interesting yeah, you know, like there's, Come there's on. only so much this I can say the there. You can <laughs> but uh, yeah, at, at Connect, you're going to see some really cool stuff okay. coming from us. So that'll be in like eight weeks from now, right? Okay. So we, uh, we're, not, we're not wasting any time. Uh, but there's a lot of cool things. Obviously, we're embracing Docker more and more at Microsoft. Mm. Uh, even our team's website uh, is running off of Kubernetes now, and we're using all of our own DevOps best practices against containers there. So I think you're going to see uh, more and more investments on containers, and we're going to see a lot of investments on serverless as well. We're just going to make sure that VSTS and Azure together should be a no-brainer. Okay. Right. There should be no other tool that you look at when you want to deploy into Azure. And if there is, I'm at Donovan Brown on Twitter. You <laughs> literally tweet at me that you think we're, we're failing, and That's you'll true. see me get the, the product team on that Twitter con conversation okay. to resolve that for you. I see nobody mm -hmm. around picking his smartphone. So <laughs> 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 yeah. Oh, I got one. Oh, I got one. Yeah. Okay, so now there's one question left. Uh, and everybody is afraid of it, and yeah. you didn't know about this yeah. question before. Okay, we didn't because tell it's you. always a surprise. So okay. yeah, it's, it's both a of you have one question. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 I was uh, <laughs> So both of you have to answer it. Okay. So if we have one magic wish for the IT world, so probably for the whole world, we all have wishes. Um, yeah. Uh, as much so. Um, what a magic wish for the IT world would you have right now? <laughs> I was about to say, can, you can go first. <laughs> um, look, I think uh, uh, jumping back to the people problem, that all of this stuff, w there are people who know how this stuff should be put together. So mm -hmm. we, we get up on stage at events like this and we try to push this message of 
you know, of, of DevOps and of ownership and things like that. But you can only reach the people that you're speaking to, the people who actually come out and see these conferences. So I think my kind of magic wish would be that everybody was at least aware that they need to know this stuff. Like okay. There's so many kind of people who sit there, they go to their office, they sit down at 9 a.m., they put their headphones on, they don't speak to anyone, no. and they don't, yeah. they don't necessarily even learn that what they're doing is probably not the best way to operate. So if that awareness was like 100%, that would be kind of my magic Okay. Magic wish, I okay. think. So you should develop a just-in-time education service just in Azure. There you, <laughs> <go>. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. This would be good. Is that more in the sector of quality control? I mean, what you're saying is at least, I mean, um, uh, somebody who's developing something, he doesn't know that he's doing it in the right way, like, for example, bad with bad code? Yeah, I mean, well, it's a magic wish, right? So, mm. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, can, you can use magic, right? But, yeah. but um, you know, when somebody sits down to, to do some work, they're aware that you know this is the right way to do things. They're aware that this is where you go to learn the right way to do stuff. I mean, that'd be fantastic. Rather than sitting there and you know opening Visual Studio 2005 and uh, <laughs> <laughs> starting a WinForms project <laughs> yeah. you know, and asking questions about Server 2003, yeah. exactly, <laughs> or Silverlight or something like Silverlight, that. Exactly, yeah. all yeah. of this cool stuff. So, yeah. Donovan, yeah. your magic wish. Uh, <laughs> my magic wish would be that we're no longer talking about DevOps. Oh. That it becomes oh, wow. so simple and so commonplace that it, we just assume everyone is doing this already. Our tools are so easy to use and so intuitive. I, I always go back to when, I remember when continuous integration was bleeding edge. Mm -hmm. I remember when it was like a lot of work to go build a CI server and if you had it, you were one of the best companies in the world because every time you commit it code, it builds. Now it literally is a checkbox. You check a box and you get that for <laughs> almost for free. I want DevOps to just be a checkbox. That would be my holy grail wish is that you and I are off solving some bigger problem because DevOps yeah. is just something we, we, we got this already, yeah. right? It's like breathing? Yes, exactly, yeah. exactly. It should be like this? Exactly, that's my hope. Okay. So Wonderful. does that mean that the UI can go away for you, or is it? I, I is it's it? funny enough is that the, m the majority of the projects that I'm working on right now are all command line. They're mm -hmm. also that you can automate, right? Yo Team is one of them. The Visual Studio PowerShell module that I wrote is one of them. The UI is no longer a hindrance for me. You don't need it, right? Because to do DevOps correctly, you just need to commit your code. The rest of it should just happen, mm -hmm. right? And if, and if it's more work than that, check your tool, tool chain, right? Because if your tool chain requires you to go babysit every connection between each piece of it, that's the wrong tool chain. Mm -hmm. All you need to do with VSTS is check in your code. The rest of it just happened. Mm. Gotcha. Wonderful. So guys, I think yeah. oh, my it was a pleasure thank for having you, you so here. Much. Pleasure was ours. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> so thank you so much and probably see you next year. Sounds good. Yeah. 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 Great yeah. conference yeah. to everybody. Yes. And have a look into all the blogs right now, the Azure blog, the, I don't know, there are so many blogs right yeah. now with all the <laughs> announcements. I cannot count them. Uh, there are also many news in the client area. Office 365 area. We'll do another episode on this. Uh, yeah, and Alex will I'm be. I'm so excited. excited <laughs> about it because this there was is a lot right of ignite. Now. There was a lot. Um, of so yeah, stay tuned mm -hmm. and thank you guys. Thank, thank you. you. See ya. <laughs>